God isn't really something to worship. He's just waiting to destroy all of us. I guess there's a God out there somewhere. I hope there is a God. God isn't really something God, to worship. Uh, God is everywhere. We want to welcome you to our online service. We have a few friends that are gathered in the sanctuary, about 50 of us, staff and uh, other friends. So if you hear clapping and you will, or you hear noises, you hear them shouting, that's what's going on. We know you're joining us online. We trust you had a good Thanksgiving uh, with your family, and we prayed that you stay healthy during the season. Now we're firmly moving into the Christmas season. I'm so excited. I wore my little like outfit to just with a little red in it to say, I'm ready for Christmas. Let's get this thing going. But we are today in the book of Hebrews chapter 1. If you turn in your Bibles there, we're going to look at that very short chapter together. By way of introduction, I was reading this week a NASA expert who said it is highly unlikely that we are alone in the universe and that we may be close to finding alien life. He went on to say, in fact, it may happen within the next two decades. Now, people have been saying this for years. We're not alone in the universe. There's life out there, intelligent life. Probably it became popularized in our generations, all the way back with Star Trek and then Star Wars. Earlier this year, NASA announced the discovery of seven Earth-sized planets in the constellation Aquarius that are warm enough to sustain life on them. And that got a lot of scientists in that community very, very excited. Well, here's the truth. We're not alone in this universe. There is highly intelligent life. His name is God. And besides God, there are other beings that are intelligent, very, very powerful, can move at unprecedented speeds. We call them angels. The Bible refers to them a lot, as we will see. And while there's no shortage of documentaries on UFOs or people's personal experience with UFOs, they've been abducted by aliens, etc., 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 the real question to ask is how much of that has something to do with angelic beings and demonic beings, something we're going to look at this time and next time. According to a CBS poll, nearly eight out of 10 Americans, 77% to be exact, believe in angels. The article said, but belief in angels is fairly widespread even among the less religious. And a majority of non-Christians think that angels exist, as do more than four out of 10 of those who never attend religious services. Over the last several years, they have, there's even been angel sightings a lot. I think it was really, really popular about 10, 15 years ago. It seems like every week I heard of angel sightings. They became as popular as Elvis sightings back in the 1970s. Um, people who would take a picture and then look at the picture later, look at it up close, and there would be some kind of maybe angelic being perhaps behind that cloud, or it could just be a light streak, but it's an angel to them. Or I've heard people say, I was driving my car, I picked up a hitchhiker, the hitchhiker was telling me about my life, and then vanished, disappeared. So we have hitchhiking angels as well. Very uh, popular are movies about angels, some of the mo more famous ones, Angels in the Outfield. Another one, Angels in the End Zone. And another one, Angels in the Infield. They seem to like Major League Sports for some reason. Um, there was a movie called The Prophecy. There was a movie in 2007 called Gabriel and one in 2010 called Legion. On and on and on the list goes. But the most famous, the classic movie about angels that comes out every time this time of year, goes all the way back to 1947, starring Jimmy Stewart called It's a Wonderful Life. 
And Jimmy Stewart uh, plays uh, George Bailey in the film. He's very depressed, loses his job, is suicidal on Christmas Eve until Clarence shows up, his guardian angel, and convinces him that his life is worth living, that he's done great things, and, and the story is, um, it's, a, it's an emotional, fun, fun little story to go on, fun little ride. Unfortunately, though, like many things, a lot of people believe in things, and they take their cues not from the scripture, but from popular media or popular books, and so it is with angels. That's why I want to look at the Bible with you to see what the Bible has to say about these very powerful and interesting beings. So we're in Hebrews chapter 1, and I want to show you a list of several traits about angels, things they do, things they are, and uh, we'll get a good running start on it. It's a short chapter, so we can read it all together. Hebrews 1 says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the world's who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they." For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. But to the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish But you remain. They will all grow old like a garment. Like a cloak, you will fold them up. And they will be changed, but you are the same, for your years will not fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not, that is, angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister? for those who will inherit salvation. Now, Hebrews chapter 1 is about Jesus, but the author compares Jesus Christ, the Son of God, with other beings, and angels are mentioned several times in this chapter as he compares them to that. So, kind of taking our cues from here, let me list several traits about angels. First of all, angels are significant. They are significant in God's plan. Six times... In those 14 verses, he mentions angels. He talks about God, the Father, Jesus, the Son, and he speaks about angels, all of them as very, very real. 34 books in the Bible talk about angels. 17 in the Old Testament, 17 in the New Testament. If you were to add up all the times that angels are mentioned, you would have almost 300 specific places where angels are mentioned in the Bible. The word angel singular shows up 199 times. The plural form angel shows up 93 times, so almost 300. When we get to the New Testament, it uses a very specific word translated into English, angel. It's the word angelos, which literally means one who is dispatched or a messenger. An angel is a messenger, as we're going to see, a messenger of God. Now, that's a word that can refer to any messenger, a human messenger, but it most often refers to these spiritual beings, a certain class of spiritual beings. 
There are other names that are mentioned in the Bible for these creatures. For example, in Job chapter 1 and chapter 2, these angels are called sons of God. And they're given that title because angels don't procreate. I'm going to touch on this again, but they are direct special creations of God and therefore can go by the term sons of God. That's Job chapter 1 and 2. They're called in Psalm 89, holy ones. They're called spirits here, a couple of places. Verse 14 calls them ministering spirits. Daniel chapter 4 refers to angels as watchers. And Ephesians and Colossians call them dominions, principalities, powers, or authorities. Then there are special kinds of angels. The Bible talks about cherubim, and cherubim were sort of like special agent angels. Their task was to guard the entrance to the Garden of Eden in the book of Genesis chapter 3. Think of sentries at Buckingham Palace, or the Swiss Guard in front of the Vatican, or the Secret Service guarding the President. On the Ark of the Covenant, there were two cherubim that were carved out with their wings touching in the middle. And God said, that is the place that I will meet you. That is the place from where I will speak to you. God was seen and called one who dwells between the cherubim, that special class of angelic beings. There's another being of angels called seraphim. And the seraphim seem to provide the background music to heaven. They're the ones crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. So we have cherubim, we have seraphim, and then we have in the book of Revelation something called living creatures. Four living creatures. Now, they may be related. They may be, may be one of the cherubim or seraphim. We're not sure. But these four living creatures are singled out as unique. They come to us in Revelation chapter 5 and Ezekiel chapter 1. And what makes them really weird is that they have very unique faces. Four faces. Um, the face of a lion. The face of an ox. The face of a man. The face of an eagle. Time forbids going into all the exegesis of that, but enough to say that there's a lot of different types of angels. Question is, where'd they come from? Answer, God made them. God created them. They didn't always exist, so they're not eternal, but they are immortal. That is, God created them, and they will never die. They will live forever. So in Genesis chapter 2, verse 1, We are told, thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. So God created the heavens and the earth, and the angelic beings called the host of heaven. Now, we don't know exactly when they were made. Some speculate they were made before the uh, heavens and the earth were made before the universe. Others figure that they were created between day one in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, and day 6. But certainly they were created before the seventh day of creation when God created human beings on the earth. And um, that is because of the text that I just read. God finished the heavens and the earth and all the host of them. So it could be they were made before he made anything else, or they were there and got to witness part of the creation having newly been made. In the book of Job, when God interrogates Job at the end of the book, it's one of the best sections of the book, God says, where were you when I created the heavens and the earth and I formed the universe? And he said concerning that, when the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. It seems to indicate that whenever God made them, they shouted for joy and got all happy when God made an inhabitable planet and put mankind on it. So let's say they were just created either 
way before he created anything else or while he was making the heavens and the earth somewhere between day one and day six. Something else, according to Jesus, they don't reproduce. They don't procreate. It's not like you have a daddy angel and a mama angel and they have sorts of, all sorts of little angels, cherubs, you know, like in the paintings, fat little babies with wings. Not at all. Again, a special creation by God, each one individual, I might even say like snowflakes. Snowflakes uh, are unique one from another. You ne never see two alike. I think God instantly created the angels, and they were all very, very unique. But Jesus said this when he was having an argument with the religious leaders of his day, and they were talking about the future resurrection, and they were trying to trap Jesus with an argument. And Jesus answered the little argument about the future resurrection by just saying this, you're ignorant, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God, but concerning the resurrection, in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, that's human beings, but are like the angels of God. So God specially made them. They are immortal but not eternal. They will live forever. Now let me throw something else at you. Do you know that you may have actually met an angel? You say, no, 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 I would have, I would have recognized an angel by the wings. Certainly I've never met an angel. Well, you wouldn't have recognized it as an angel. The book of Hebrews chapter 13 says, don't forget to show hospitality to strangers for some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. I think that one of the reasons we tend to dismiss the idea of angels, most people do, by the way, they don't give angels a thought as being real or being in their world, is because of all of the Hollywood movies, all of the sightings people have had, all of the lame caricatures that people have come up with. You know, angels always have long robes. They always sit on clouds. They always play harps. They're always fair-skinned and often feminine, right? They're always female. That's how they're portrayed. One man said that his wife reminded him of an angel because she was always up in the air harping about something. Well, in the Bible, uh, these creatures are very, very strong. Michael, for example, in the book of Daniel, is a warrior angel. And the Talmud, the Jewish writings from the past, always describe angels as fiery beings. In one little passage of the Talmud said the essence of angels is fire. So one thing we know is they are very, very powerful. So they're significant in God's plan. That's the first trait. The second trait, they are several in number. Uh, in verse 4, 5, 6 of uh, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 4, 5, 6, 7, 13, and 14, it uses the plural, angels, angels. How many angels are there? Answer, we don't know. A lot would be a good answer. A whole lot. We don't exactly know how many, but let me give you my take on this. There are only three that are identified in the scripture by name. Number one is Michael. Michael is called, interestingly, an archangel, archangelos, some kind of superpower being in rank, an archangel. He's called that in Jude verse 9. But when Michael shows up in the Old Testament and in the book of Revelation, he is seen as a protector, a warrior protector of a nation, the nation of Israel. He is associated specifically with guarding and protecting God's people, the Israelites. That's in Daniel chapter 10 and in the book of Revelation chapter 12. Uh, another one by name after Daniel is Gabriel. Uh, Gabriel shows up in Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 9, and in the New Testament, Luke chapter 2. He seems to be one who's involved in the coming of Jesus Christ. He's the one that gives the announcement uh, to Mary and Joseph that they're going to have a baby, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. That is Gabriel. 
The third one mentioned is, anybody know? Lucifer. This is before he fell. Isaiah chapter 14, he is called Lucifer. Lucifer means uh, son of the morning or light bearer or day star or shining star. Lucifer, son of the morning. How are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? So those three are mentioned. Now back to the number of angels. We don't exactly know how many there are, but do you know that people have guessed how many there are? In fact, I read about one guy in the Middle Ages named Albertus Magnus, or Albert the Great. He was a philosopher. He was a theologian, uh, and he also taught science at the time. And he said he knew the precise number, and I know you want to know exactly how many angels there are. So according to Albertus Magnus, there are 399,920,004. Have no idea how he calculated that or came up with it. But we know there must be a lot because, for example, when God gives the law on Mount Sinai, we're told in Deuteronomy that the Lord came with myriads of his holy ones or angelic beings. At the birth of Jesus Christ, there was a multitude of the angelic hosts or company of angels. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 22, it says that when we worship, we worship with an innumerable company of angels. Innumerable. Can't number them. Doesn't mean that you can't have a, 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 an exact number eventually, but when he saw that, it's just an innumerable crowd. Probably closer to the number is Revelation chapter 5, when John sees the vision of the heavenly um, system and set up. It says, then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures, the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousand. So at least there are 100 million angels. That's the math there. Plus thousands of others. So let's just safely guess there are probably billions of angels. They're innumerable. So they're significant in God's plan. They're several in number. A third trait of angels. They are seen only rarely. Notice that they are called spirits here. Verse 14 of Hebrews 1. Are they, the angels, not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will inherit salvation? So they are spirit beings. They are non-corporeal beings. That is, they don't have a physical body. Ordinarily. I want to qualify that. Ordinarily. You say, ordinarily? What does that mean? Sometimes they do. For whatever purpose, God's purpose, he allows angels from time to time to have some kind of a human visage. After all, even in Hebrews, it says some have entertained angels without knowing it. So they have some kind of a physical manifestation or God gives a person the ability to see into the spiritual realm which is very, very real. We don't see it, but from time to time, God allows that to happen. Now, the best example um, I can think of when it comes to trying to, to understand this uh, comes from a movie, comes from a series called Star Trek. So in Star Trek, any Trekkies here? We have any Trekkies? Okay, so in Star Trek, what did they do for entertainment on long trips? It was called the holodeck, the holodeck. The holodeck was a room that you went in, and it was like a, a, a virtual reality room. In the holodeck, you could create holograms, three-dimensional images that you design, and then have an experience, like a vacation. So if you're an earthling, you could create in the holodeck the Alps, and you could have a trek, a hike through the Alps. If you were a Klingon, you could recreate famous battles from the past and hone and test your battle skills. And when you're all done with the holodeck, you simply say, computer and program. So from time to time, God puts his program in place so people can actually see angels. One of the famous ones is a guy by the name of Balaam. Balaam was on a donkey 
was not obeying God. In Numbers 22, the Lord opened Balaam's eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way with him with his sword drawn in his hand. Uh Uh-oh. Don't mess with that angel. One of my famous or favorite stories is a a less famous story, but I love it. It's about Elijah in 2 Kings chapter 6. In 2 Kings chapter 6, Elisha the prophet and his assistant go to a town called Dothan, D-O-T-H-N. They're kind of hiding there until they're found out, and the Syrians come down and surround the town of Dothan. So the assistant to Elisha says, Alas, master, we're surrounded. And I love it. Elisha said, actually, there are more with us than with them. And I'm sure that uh, his assistant looked at him and said, there are. Uh, We're surrounded by an army. How is that possible? And so Elisha the prophet prayed. I love his prayer. Lord, open his eyes that he may see. And the servant of Elisha looked and was able to see chariots and horses and a vast army all around the army of Syria, surrounding them. So before he was thinking, poor us, we're surrounded. And he thought, poor them. They're surrounded by an entire army of angels. So they are seen rarely. Let me give you a couple more examples. They were security guards They were the first security guards in the Bible. Genesis chapter 3, they kept Adam and Eve from going back into the garden, holding up a flaming sword. Adam and Eve were able to see them. Uh, Three angels were Abraham's dinner guests in uh, Genesis chapter 18. Actually, two of them were angels. One was God, the Bible tells us. Now, I don't know what you serve an angel for dinner. I'm guessing angel hair pasta would be a safe bet. Uh, Topped off with angel food cake. You couldn't go wrong with that. But we don't know. Uh, They were also divine bouncers. Uh, They showed up in in a physical form in Sodom and Gomorrah when the men of Sodom made sexual advances at Lot and his family. And here's an interesting thing. One time it seemed that an angel shows up and, and enjoyed scaring people. What I mean by that is when Jesus rose from the dead in Matthew 28, it says, an angel of the Lord descended from heaven, came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. I've always loved that. Roll the stone away and just sit there and wait. And it says, his countenance was like lightning, his clothing as white as snow, and the guards, the Roman guards, shook for fear of him and became like dead men. I just picture the angel just going, <laughs> that's fun. Then there was a special ops agent in Acts chapter 12 that released Peter from prison. Peter was able to see this being. The church had prayed for him and an angel was sent. So they're significant in God's plan. They're several in number. They're seen only rarely. I'll give you a fourth trait as seen in Hebrews 1. They stand in God's presence. They stand in God's presence. There's a hint of that in verse 6 where we are told when he brings the firstborn into the world. Now this is the the nativity. This is the Christmas scene. When he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all the angels of God worship him. Like troops that surround a king, like uh, a secret service group of agents that surround or stand with a dignitary, so are these angels. They stand in God's presence. They're ready for action, ready for service. Daniel chapter 7, Daniel gets a vision of heaven. He sees the Ancient of Days on a throne. And he writes, A thousand thousands ministered to him, then thousand times ten thousand stood before him. There they are, standing before the Lord. Revelation chapter 8, an insight into what's going on in the heavenly scene. I saw the seven angels 
who stand before God. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all of the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of all the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. In Luke chapter 2, Gabriel identifies himself as one who stands before God. When he gave that announcement, you're going to have a son. I am one who stands before the Lord. Now, some theologians try to get really picky with this, and they call these seven angels that I just told you about in Revelation 8 the presence angels. But Daniel, there's thousands upon thousands standing, ministering, waiting to, uh, to do the bidding of the Lord. A fifth trait or characteristic of angels is they share in God's work. Verse 7, of the angels, he says, who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. Now, you know, the word angel means a messenger. So somebody who's sent, somebody who's dispatched. And it would seem that angels were used by God at different periods of history for special events that occurred that God wanted their involvement, wanted their help. In Psalm uh, 103, uh, they are called mighty ones who do his bidding and who obey his word. Years and years ago, Billy Graham wrote a book about angels called God's Secret Agents. Sometimes they're secret, sometimes they're not so secret. But they share in God's work. For example, they were present at creation. Job 38. They served God when the law was given at Mount Sinai. When the revelation was given to Daniel, God used angels. And they were very involved in the life of Jesus Christ, as I've already showed you. An angel announced his birth. Angels were singing in the skies above Bethlehem at his birth. Angels warned Mary and Joseph about Herod the Great wanting to kill the child. When Jesus was tempted in the desert, the angels ministered to him. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and sweating great drops of blood and in agony, angels came and ministered to him. And of course, at the resurrection, they rolled the stone away. When you get to the book of Revelation, the end times will have almost like a, uh, the activity of angels on steroids. Uh, they're mentioned 75 times in the book of Revelation alone. An angel doing this, angels worshiping, angels with bowls poured out on the earth, angels with trumpets announcing a future judgment. This is something that shouldn't surprise us. Jesus said that angels will assist in the final judgment. Jesus said the Son of Man will send out his angels and they will gather out of the kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Quick question. How powerful are angels? Well, they're called mighty ones. Uh, Paul calls them powers, uh, uh, dominions, authorities, thrones. So these are rankings of angels that have enormous power. One angel in the Old Testament killed 185,000 Assyrians. You don't want to tick off an angel. And if you think of one angel killing 185,000, that puts a whole new blush and texture on what Jesus said in the Garden of Gethsemane when he said to Peter, put up your sword. Don't you know that I could call for 12 legions of angels? That's 72,000. So if one angel can knock off 185,000, imagine what 72,000 could do. They are very, very powerful. So they're significant in God's plan. They're several in number. They are seen only rarely, they stand in God's presence, and they share in God's work. I'll give you a final one. We could go on, but I'll give you a final one. Six, they serve God's people. This is to us the best news of all. It's fun to learn about them. 
But it's wonderful to think that God uses them for our benefit. For example, look at verse 13. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies a footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth, here's part of their job description, to minister, to help, to serve, to attend to, to minister for those who will inherit salvation. That's us. God uses angels in your life to do his work. You say, well, what do angels do for me? Let me give you just a few things. Number one, they watch us. They watch us. Daniel calls angels watchers. So they're people watchers. Think of them as heavenly surveillance teams. Others would call that spying. You know, we don't like it when the government knows what we're doing, watches what we're doing. Let me tell you, God's government knows everything you're doing. The mic is always on. The camera is always on. There's nothing you do in secret, but you don't have an audience of angels. So they are watchers. They watch our obedience. They watch our disobedience. So they watch us. Second, they protect us. They protect us. Psalm 37, the angel of the Lord guards all those who fear him and rescues them. I'm sure that if we were to go through this room with just the 50 people we have here, I'm sure if I were to ask you, our audience at home, you could tell me stories in your life that could or couldn't have been the intervention of an angel. I can tell you my own stories where I believe angels of God rescued my life. Happened to Daniel. In the lion's den, after he was rescued, he said, my God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth. I'm sure he saw some kind of a being go to that, to that lion, shut its mouth. In Acts chapter 12, as I mentioned, an angel was sent from heaven to rescue Peter from prison so he wouldn't die. So they watch us, they protect us, they join us. Whenever we worship, we are joining the choirs of heaven, or you might say they are joining us. They are beings who have been worshiping God for a long, long time. In Hebrews chapter 12, he talks about worship. He says, you have come to the heavenly Jerusalem, to the city of the living God. You have come to thousands upon thousands of angels in joyful assembly. Now, one of the great thoughts for me that enhances my own worship of God is to realize um, with a sense of reverence and joy that I am being joined in my worship by these beings. It's like, they're doing what we do. Let's join them. The Bible also says when a sinner comes to repentance, all the angels in heaven rejoice. So they watch us, they protect us, they join us. Finally, they usher us. They usher us. Um, in the New Testament, uh, Luke 16, Jesus tells a story, not a parable, a story of a rich man uh, and Lazarus. And he said, the rich man died and was buried, but with Lazarus, he was ushered into Abraham's bosom, ushered into the presence of God. Imagine that. One moment you're a beggar on earth in poverty, the next moment, angels of God are taking you into his presence. And I think that when every child of God dies, they don't turn into angels as, I don't know, wherever that came from, but angels do attend that person's soul and convey it into the presence of God, turning every tragedy of death into a triumph for a child of God. That's why in Psalm 116 it says, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Well, something else you need to know about angels. As they watch us, they study with curiosity and amazement God's grace. It says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12, he talks about our salvation and God's work in our lives, God's work of grace. He says, which things the angels desire to look into. You know, I think angels look at us and go, I can't believe that skip guy is so stupid. 
He doesn't take advantage of God's mercy and grace and help more often. Or he doesn't do this. I'm looking at, he's such a bonehead and yet God loves him so much. I don't get it. What's with these people that God loves? J.B. Phillips, who is a New Testament scholar, brilliant scholar, had a fun little story of an angel showing um, a newcomer angel the universe. And so they're flying around, and they are whirling past galaxies, and they get into this one called the Milky Way. And there's one particular planet called the Earth. And so, J.B. Phillips writes, the senior angel pointed to a small sphere turning slowly on its axis. It looked as dull and as dirty as a tennis ball to the little angel, whose mind was filled with the size and glory of what he had just seen. Watch that one, particularly the senior angel pointing with his finger said. "Ah, It looks very small to me, said the angel, speaking of the earth. What's so special about that one? He listened in stunned disbelief as the senior angel told him that this planet, small and insignificant and not overly clean, was the renowned visited planet. Do you mean, said the young angel, that our glorious prince stooped so low as to become one of these creeping, crawling creatures in that floating ball? I do, and I don't think that he would like you calling them creepy, crawling creatures. For strange as it may seem to us, he loves them. He went down to visit them, to lift them up, to become like him. The little angel looked blank. Such a thought was almost beyond his comprehension. You know, the idea of angelic beings is beyond most of our comprehension. The idea of God is beyond our comprehension. The idea of God sending his son to die for us is beyond comprehension. The idea of sending his Holy Spirit to live in us beyond our comprehension. But it's true. And just as there is a physical universe that is real, a world that is real, and people say, get real, man, live in the real world, there's another world that's the really real world. And one day you'll be able to see it. One day you'll be with the angels in heaven if you're a believer, or you'll be with fallen angels in hell if you are not a believer. You see, God gives you incredible power to make a choice that determines your destiny. And during this Christmas season that we're coming into, we celebrate the visited planet that God sent his son into this world to pay for our sins, to raise us up to new life. But you have to say, come in, Lord, be my savior. If you've never done that, I'm going to give you an opportunity. You're watching this at home. You're watching this on your device. You're seeing this on your computer, your television, wherever you might be, maybe a radio station. Maybe you've never sincerely given your life to Christ. I want to give you that opportunity. Do it right now. Say a simple prayer. Let me lead you. Say this to him. Say it out loud wherever you are. Say, Lord, here I am. Take my life. I give myself to you. I know that I'm a sinner. I have blown it. I have fallen short. Forgive me. I believe Jesus died on a cross, shed his blood for my sin, and I believe he rose again from the dead. I believe he's alive right now, and I believe he's coming again. I don't understand it. I believe it. I give you my life. I turn from my sin. I repent. I turn to Jesus as Lord, as Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, dear God, and help me to live a life that pleases you. I can't do it alone. I need you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Listen, if you prayed that prayer, if you have your phone with you, text the word SAVED, S-A-V-E-D, to area code 505 544 5433 saved 
to 505-509-5433. Or if you're on our website, calvarynm.church, there's a little button, I think it's on the right, called No God, K-N-O-W, not N-O, but K-N-O-W, No God. Click that. And either way, if you text it by phone or you uh, click that little button, we're going to contact you. We're going to tell you next steps, what it is to have a walk with the Lord, a relationship with Him. Congratulations, though, if you prayed that prayer. And welcome to God's family. We want to pray for you, walk with you, and help you in those next steps. God bless you. We hope you enjoyed this special service from Calvary Church. We'd love to know how this message impacted you. Email us at mystory@calvarynm.church. And just a reminder, you can support this ministry with a financial gift at calvarynm.church/give. Thank you for joining us for this teaching from Calvary Church.